All right, so uh, first of all, I, I have to apologize for changing my topic of my, of my talk. Um, I originally wanted to talk, um, I'm working on a, I think I'm working on a short monograph on Wittgenstein's uncertainty, which I think has, there's been a good deal of interest in it lately, but I think it's been large, the book has been seriously misunderstood. Um, and the, the consensus view of what it's about is really not what it's about. Um, I do think Wittgenstein's very interested in the topic I was going to talk about, the topic of deep disagreement. We often think of rationality and reasonableness as a certain kind of responsiveness to argument. And uh, I happen to think that, um, well, there are limits to getting people to change their mind by straightforward argument, and I think that's one of the themes of Wittgenstein's uncertainty. But to get that, I had to do some background in what I think the book is really about. And I'm afraid by the time I got to explain some of the background, I already had more slides that I could get through. Uh, so, so we may get onto deep disagreement, but uh, it's sort of the background to that. Um, okay, so um, here's a. Here's a kindred spirit, I think, um, a philosopher that I've been taking some interest in late in life, um, Heidegger. And this is from his um, lecture notes that he was working on, that he, from the lecture he was giving him, he was working on being in time. And it, he says the following, it's nowhere prescribed that there must be a problem of knowledge. Perhaps it's precisely the task of a philosophical investigation, ultimately to deprive many problems of their sham existence to reduce the number of problems and promote investigation which opens the way to the matters themselves. And I think that actually sums up what Wittgenstein is about. Uh, he wants to get rid of many of the problems that have dominated academic discussion of doubt, reasonableness, particularly those that center on radical skepticism, and see what problems might be inherent in a more realistic view of our actual epistemic situation, the matters themselves, so to say. Uh, so we'll be working towards the matters themselves, but we won't actually get to the matters themselves. So we will, however, have something to say about the sham problems and uh, the sham epistemologies that are generated by them. Okay, so um, anyway, I mean, philosophers in epistemology are often interested in r rational beliefs or reasonable beliefs, but I'm going to... Uh, be more interested um, in doubts. And uh, uh, although I'm mostly taking my cue, as I say here, from Wittgenstein, I'll be following Austin's methodology and taking interest in antonyms. Not so much what it is to be reasonable as to what it is to be unreasonable or irrational. Uh, I think this was, you know, this something Austin did in a plea for excuses and, and elsewhere. Don't, uh, don't look for the core meaning of you know, the positive term, but look at the derelictions from the preferred state and, ca and cast doubt on it, as it were, uh, from that angle. So uh, anyway, I went through some good Austinian uh, stuff, but l l l let, me, let me skip that. So here's the consensus view of, of, of uncertainty. And it's a view about limits to doubt, but at the same time a view about limits to knowledge or justification. They go together in this consensus reading. And the thought is that, as I say here, the scope for doubt is much more limited than skeptics imagine. This is uh, allegedly Wittgenstein's view. Well, it is his view, but, um, but it's spelled out like this. Um, picking on a couple of key metaphors that emerge in the notes that constitute uncertainty. And the thought is that our practices of epistemic evaluation depend on, and indeed inquiry, depend on framework certainties, or a framework of certainties, the riverbed of inquiry, or the hinges which must stay fixed if the door is to turn. These are commitments that lie apart, as Wittgenstein says, from the route traveled by inquiry. And his key thought is supposedly this, that because they make epistemic evaluation possible, they themselves cannot be doubted. But by the same token, they cannot be justified or known either. They are simply, as it were, 
outside the scope of rational evaluation. Uh, Duncan Pritchard, who is an exponent of this view in his recently and rather extensively discussed book, Academic Doubts, says they are irrational commitments. Now, um, I think that this, I, I'm really trying to kill off hinge epistemology before it spreads. <laughs> you know, I mean, in fact, it's already spreading, so, uh, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, maybe I, uh, I think it fails um, as a response to skepticism. I think it fails utterly because I think, in fact, it's disastrously concessive. But, um, there's a pattern that Barry Stroud uh, identified long ago about how in engaging with skepticism, philosophers often find themselves driven to epistemologies that are very hard to distinguish from skepticism itself. <laughs> um, I, I mean, no joking, they seem to be skepticism in other words, as it were, L little more than, than, than a verbal evasion. And I, and I think this is the case here. Um, I, but I also think it fails as a reading of Wittgenstein. Um, and of course, I think with uncertainty, they are scribbled notes that were never um, revised for publication. And um, a student of um, Penelope Maddy's did a minute philological investigation of the notes. I mean, I used to refer to them as notebooks, but apparently many of them were scribbled on folded pieces of paper, and even the order in which they were intended to be read, or the order in which they were composed, is far from clear. And, uh, he looked into th such detailed things as the different colored inks in which they were written, uh, and, and then there's the unfortunate thing that Wittgenstein himself didn't like many of the notes that are in the, in the the middle numbers, roughly between 67 and uh, 66 and 299, because um, he was being given these experimental hormone treatments for his advanced cancer, and um, felt that they le well, and it was no side effect that you were not cognitively at the top of your game, and uh, so you have to read those notes with. Uh, uh, Fortunately, the hinge passage does not come from uh, that part of the, so, so the hinge people are okay there. Um, but anyway, there's a, there, even if his views are not settled, there's a definite, um, and I think perhaps predominant inclination in uncertainty to treat hinge commitments as in fact things we know to be true. And um, although, along with many other things, this is questioned in, in, in the very last days, uh, but... Um, Nevertheless, this is a line of thought which I think hinge epistemology completely ignores. And that's what I'll talk about today. So his view is that there are limits to reasonable doubt, and indeed there's limits to intelligible doubt. Um, but they run up against um, the fact that some things are simply known. Um, so I think, oddly enough, in uncertainty we find the beginnings of a rather distinctive version of what's come to be known as knowledge-first epistemology. Um, that argument based on evidence, reasons, doubts, by the same token, always take place in an extensive context of things that are simply known. Um, so let's, let's think about why that could be. Um, but going back to this, with admirable honesty, um, Duncan Pritchard identifies what he calls a core problem for the view that he himself endorses, namely this. If these so-called hinge commitments are, quote, neither knowable nor even justifiable, aren't they just a rational commitments? But if so, how does Wittgenstein's answer to skepticism differ from skepticism itself? Now, I think, in fact, all the various versions of this reading of uncertainty are, can be seen as reactions to this core problem. So Strawson says in his early and rather classic little book, Skepticism and Naturalism, go back to the 80s, Strawson says, well, they're really like Humean natural beliefs. That's why they lie apart from the, the road travel by inquiry. Crispin Wright says they are, they are, in a sense, a kind of pragmatically rational entitlement. You can't, they can't be epistemically justified, but they are in an important way cognitively enabling. So um, 
in some cases they are uh, well it's but I won't go into the details but the idea is to react to this by saying well yes in a way they're not justifiable but another way we are rationally entitled to them which uh, um, and, and on and on, I mean, the, the extreme versions say they're not even propositional commitments at all. That's Danielle moyle Sharrock. Duncan's own view is that they're propositional, but they're not beliefs in the knowledge apt sense. I didn't know there were different senses of belief. But, um, my view, I want to argue it, is that this problem has no solution. I mean, that these are desperate remedies once the concession that what we like to think of as knowledge depends on a foundation of groundless certainties. Once that concession has been made, you are forced into some kind of way of putting a better face on the concession to the skeptic. That's, that's my thought. That's the way in which it... I mean, it's not that all the things that people say in defense of this view are necessarily false. I mean, I even share some of Crispin Wright's view on... Uh, uh, how things that are pragmatic entitlements, there are such things, yes, absolutely. But um, when it's dragooned into defending what's already a very, very significant concession to the opposition, then I think that's more weight than the notion can bear. On the other hand, if these commitments amount to knowledge, the problem does not arise. Um, well, let me just quote you the hinge passages as they are usually quoted by proponents of hinge epistemology. And here they go, it's 341. The questions we raise and our doubts are dependent on the fact that some propositions are exempt from doubt, are, as it were, like hinges on which those turn. That's to say, it belongs to the logic of our scientific, our this is Shastakan, investigations that certain propositions are indeed not doubted. But it isn't that the situation is like this, we just can't investigate everything, and for that reason we are forced to rest content with assumption. If I want the door to turn, the hinges must stay put. And this is a, one of the main inspirations for Crispin Wright's view, that they, they enable our inquiries. They are, as he puts it, entitlements of cognitive project. Um, now, uh, Sorry, I think I've got my um, things slightly out of order here. Uh, l l let me get back to my, my actual view before doing the uh, core problem. But where, where are we here? Uh, oh, other way. Uh, okay, I think maybe I... Well, let me just uh, talk you through my, my objection to this. Um, Do you have slides because we can't see it? <laughs> yeah, we're not actually going... Oh, oh. So the slides change. The slides are changing on my. Uh, I, I, I. Gosh, look, it's like Wittgenstein says, you know, Lavoisier doesn't worry that the chemical apparatus disappears when he turns his back, but uh, <laughs> I, I fail to worry that the slides didn't change. <laughs> Uh, do you know what to do with this? No. Does anyone have to fix this? Can I, can I just change them on the... Uh... Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Let's start over. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, so, now it makes sense. <laughs> so, um, so, if you look at these passages, you'll, you should notice two things about them. The first one is the ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Um, they miss out. These wo three words are missed out. And the words that are missed out, typically when this is quoted, the words are, that is to say. In other words, this passage is a gloss on the preceding passage. And though I can't quote it completely from memory, I can tell you the words it begins with. They are, we know with the same certainty that we believe any mathematical proposition that various things, that red is the color of blood, that human beings have blood and call it blood. In other words, the hinge passages are an explanation of things that are known to be true. So, uh, obviously those words have to be missed out for the... Uh, 
outside the, the range of knowledge entirely. Few. The second thing, of course, uh, that is, is, not, no, is sometimes acknowledged but then discounted, um, is that Wittgenstein does not present here his view of knowledge in general. It's a comment about our scientific investigations in the broad German sense of systematic or disciplinary inquiry. In fact, the only point made by these much quoted passages is that systematic investigation takes place against the background of everyday knowledge. That's all these passages say, if you read them as written. Um, uh, when I said this to Duncan Pritchard at a conference on hinge epistemology, he said to me, oh, well, of course he's more... He, he, yes, he says scientific investigations, but it's clear that he means the view to have wider application than that. To which the answer is, no, it isn't. Uh, it's not clear. In fact, it's pretty clearly not what he's saying. So, so but notice, if I'm right about this, then the, these hinge passages are irrelevant to problems of radical skepticism. They presuppose a solution to it. They're not the solution themselves. They, they take the solution for granted. Now, I don't know if I'll... I'll now, there are passages that um, I'll just mention briefly where people say this can't be true what you're saying, because Wittgenstein says flat out that claiming knowledge with respect to bedrock certainties is nonsense. And here, here's a typical passage. I know that a sick man is lying here. Nonsense. So I don't know then. Neither the question nor the assertion makes any sense any more than the assertion I am here, which I might yet use at any moment if a suitable occasion presented itself. I think these passages, though, are far less conclusive than people think. Um, first of all, it, it seems to me here, I'm not claiming that Wittgenstein had got all the way to Grice, but it seems quite clear here that Wittgenstein is thinking about not so much knowing as claiming to know whether the speech act that is typically executed by an explicit claim to know could have any place with respect to, as it were, banal things that, if I know them, everybody knows them. Um, so I, th I, I think another possible reading here is that it's saying I know which is badly out of place. Um, um, so I, I, I think it's quite clear in many cases by saying I know with respect to the most obvious and banal claims. It would be wholly unclear what speech act, if any, was being performed. So compare Austin on uh, felicity conditions and um, think of Christa's work on, 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 on this. Um, in that sense, anyway, I'm talking nonsense. But it doesn't follow from this that such things are not things we all know. Um, uh, just referring back to Christa's book on, on Austin, um, uh, it's very worth bearing in mind, as everyone knows, that Wittgenstein, in uncertainty, though, is often concerned with quite extraordinary knowledge claims, namely those made by Moore in his proof and defense. That's to say, Moore um, says, I know, in a philosophical context in which the legitimacy of skeptical doubts has already been conceded. Now, it's certainly ineffective to, for more to insist that he knows things that the skeptic says he doesn't know, if that's all he's got to offer. Um, here I like Krista's argument that a common speech act function of saying I know is to offer assurance. I mean, you can't assuage the skeptic, I can't assuage the skeptic's doubts by assuring him that I know. I mean, don't worry, you may not know there's a hand here, but I do. Uh, <laughs> take my word for it. Um, it simply bypasses the argument. You, you can't do that. It's dialectically ineffective. And there are other passages, anyway. The closest pl place of uncertainty and actual definition of knowledge is I know equals I am familiar with it as a certainty. Again, no help against skepticism. The skepticism, skeptic knows you're familiar with it as a certainty, but wonders whether you know it. Um, uh, finally, I mean, assurance uh, is not in prospect with respect to shared bedrock certainties. Check out this. I believe, for example, I know as much about this matter, the existence of the earth, as Moore does. And that if he knows it, knows that it is as he says, then I know it too. But surely 
it cannot be Wittgenstein's view that the phrase common knowledge is an oxymoron. Uh, things that I can't really usefully offer assurance to. Um, now, if you, if you go to a later passage, and again, there's a strong echoes of Austin here. Um, not sure if they're echoes, I mean, since I'm not sure that... Uh, Austin, actually, Austin had no time for Wittgenstein, I think. He's, Moore was my man, he said. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, one says, I know what one is ready to give compelling grounds. I know relates to a possibility of demonstrating the truth. But if what he believes is of such a kind that the grounds he can give are no surer than his assertion, then he cannot say he knows what he believes. So again, I'd like to compare this with um, something that Krishna says about Austin. In offering assurance by saying I know, I imply that I'm in possession of a conclusive reason. Um, and in a sense here, it seems to me that both Wittgenstein and Austin are suggesting what we might call an infallibilist account of knowledge. That's to say that if I know, in some sense I can't be wrong. That when I know, the possibility of error is excluded. But it's important to note, however, that this is not incorrigibility. Um, I can non-culpably take myself to know when it turns out, as further information comes in, that circumstances were against me. So, we, and Vickers then also reminds us, don't forget the expression, I thought I knew. In, so an infallibleist view of knowledge does not mean that knowledge must be what luminous, as, as, as Williamson puts it. Um, you can, you can, the entitlement conditions for quite justifiably taking yourself to know do not extend to all the way through to the commitments that you undertake when you so represent yourself, when you represent yourself as knowledge. You commit yourself to more than is needed to entitle yourself to represent yourself as knowing. So, you know, it turns out the I, I had no reason to think, but the situation was not quite what I imagined it to be, and the knowledge claim must be withdrawn. I can retrospectively see there was an error possibility I had no reason to account for, but nevertheless was there, in which case the knowledge claim uh, was false. Uh, knowing is not, as Victor Zeiling says, a mental state like surmising or being convinced. Uh, and you might think, whoever did think that? Well, the answer was lots of people thought that, particularly uh, in the interwar period. Cook Wilson, I think, maybe H.A. Pritchard, or so, you know, if you, if, you, if you dig back into the, you know, the deep history of Oxford philosophy, you'll find uh, that view. Charles Travis calls it the accretion. He also defends an Austinian uh, infallibilist view of knowledge, but you've got to take away the accretion, which is, and when you know, it is luminous to you that you do. Uh, Williamson's view is, uh, it, um, knowledge first is the Oxford tradition, I think. Um, anyway, so, so let's just, now, uh, what time do I have left? Uh, not very long. Let's actually run through some of Wittgenstein's actual thoughts. Th this is, I think, his master thought, not the in, um, uncertainty, not the hinge passage, but the very first thing he says. He's thinking of Moore's proof. If you do know that here is one hand, we'll grant you all the rest. And then the following comment. When one says that such and such proposition can't be proved, of course that does not mean that it can't be d derived from other propositions. Any proposition can be derived from other propositions, but they may be no more certain than it is itself. And this is further glossed in the second remark. From its seeming to me or to everyone to be so, it doesn't follow that it is so. What we can ask is whether it can make sense to doubt it. If someone says, I don't know if there's a hand here, he might be told, look closer. This possibility of satisfying oneself is part of the language game, is one of its essential features. I think what's going on here is, you might think we are faced with a dilemma. If we assume plausibly enough that basic certainties involving empirical propositions are not self-evident, then here's the dilemma. They can't be proved, because if they're basic certainties, by definition, nothing is more certain than they are. But nevertheless, are all taking them to be so, 
yields only subjective certainty. We're all convinced, but that doesn't mean that we're right. But there is, in fact, a way between the horns. Namely, propositions like this will be objectively certain if we cannot make sense of doubting them. In other words, if we run up against a limit of intelligibility with respect to doubting. Now, Wittgenstein doesn't say um, what it takes here for an expression of doubt to be intelligible, or Sinval is the German, which um, is about as wide-ranging as the English sensible. They can't sensibly doubt it. I mean, it might not make sense in the deep sense that no one even knows what you're trying to say, or it might not make sense in that what idiot would doubt that, you know? I mean, you can understand it, but you can't understand, you can understand that somebody's doubting it, but you can't understand why, as opposed to you just can't understand the expression of doubt at all. I think it, the answer is Wittgenstein uses this word with, deliberately because of its wide range. He's interested in all those forms of ways in which doubting can fail to, quote, make sense. But initially, he's on the, He's, he's focused on the, the very question of intelligibility. Can we even understand an expression of doubt in just any circumstance? And I think the answer is no. And once again, I think there's a convergence with Austin here. I mean, if I'm uncertain whether Moore has held up his hand when he's giving his famous proof, surely this must be, there must be some reason for this. That must be because I didn't get a good look, for example. I wasn't looking when Moore held up his hand, or perhaps I didn't have my proper glasses on, or something. Um, and this, I think, relates to Austin's definite lack condition on, on, on an intelligible doubt, when, when a question, how do you know, is asked pointedly. But supposing me to be close enough to see, and more or less normally cited, no one would have a clue what I meant if I still claim not to know where there's a hand here. I mean, suppose I suddenly started now saying, oh my God, where's the computer gone? There isn't the computer here. You told me I have a computer, Sven. Where's my computer? This would be what Wittgenstein calls mental disturbance, perhaps, of a transient kind. <laughs> not, not an especially sort of unusual expression of doubt. Um, it, it, it's not just the intelligible ability of the utterance. It would be my state of mind that, that, that would be called into question. Um, irrational doubt is only possible up to a point. If, it becomes, if the expression of doubt becomes sufficiently rational, the question of whether the person you're dealing with is, in, is an appropriate subject of any kind of epistemic evaluation comes up. That's the thought. Now, you might say that the skeptic really isn't bothered by this because the Cartesian skeptic actually provides ground for doubt in the forms of skeptical hypotheses and Wittgenstein imagines one. Um, after all, no one's ever seen his brain. He believes he has one, but it's imaginable that if the top of his skull were cut off, uh, we'd only see um, empty space. But so what? I mean, I think his point here is we can imagine, that's to say, picture or make up stories about all sorts of things, but they're not grounds for doubt. Skeptical hypotheses are, in fact, not grounds for doubt. They are fairy tales. Um, when people say, I can imagine I'm a brain in a vat, it's like saying, I can imagine Wiley e. Coyote running off the cliff and remaining suspended in midair till he makes the fatal mistake of looking down, at which case he plummets to his doom. The fact that one can imagine that is no reason to doubt the law of gravity. <laughs> I mean, what you can picture, um, I, I mean, a number of people have made this point over the years, but it never seems to stick. Uh, Gert Buchtal, in a discussion of you, asks whether ma we can ima imagine marigolds growing on the moon. And the answer is yes, we can. You can draw a cartoon, you know, with little flower and a kind of astonished spaceman looking at it. Uh, but actually, the very concept of flower builds in all kinds of 
nomological commitments. Flowers grow in the soil uh, they, from which they take nutrients. They need to be watered, as any gardener knows. And unfortunately, the conditions on the moon are not propitious. Uh, so the fact that you can picture things. Um, I, I, I very... I heard at the APA at San Diego, Adam Leiter said to Pen Penelope Maddy, I love this, that um, demon deception is impossible because there are no evil demons. That's exactly right, I think. That's exactly right. Uh, and one should resist, and Stephen Toulmin in a neglected book, made this point long ago. Don't start slicing and dicing the notion of possibility to save these arguments. Um, you know, if the question comes up, is it possible for me, Michael Williams, who A, is now on the wrong side of 70, and B, was pretty crappy at football to begin with, to be called up and invited to play centre forward for Liverpool next Saturday? The answer to this question is not, it depends what you mean by possible, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, unless most of my everyday, banal everyday claims are true and epistemically unproblematic and therefore on a, not appropriate objects of speech acts like assurance, I wouldn't be able to think, speak or think conceptually at all. As Wittgenstein says, the truth, anticipating Davidson, the truth of my statements is the test of my understanding of these statements. That's to say, if I make certain false statements, it becomes uncertain whether I understand them. And in this respect, there is no essential difference between elementary mathematical propositions, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 12 times 12 uh, equals 144, and simple empirical propositions. And here I have to quote a former teacher, I think Gilbert Harmon, who was discussing Larry Bonjour on the topic of pure reason. Um, Bonjour gives us an example of a proposition known by rational insight, 3 plus 5 equals 8 drawing from harm and the somewhat acidic comment, this is something I learned in school, what's rational insight got to do with it? Um, deeply Wittgensteinian comment, I think. Um, so, okay, so the mental disturbance, I talked about that. But the, the, the worry now, and then I'll have to stop, is whether all these banal remarks about how we proceed in everyday life, and the same would apply to Austin too, um, don't they just ignore the philosophical question, how do we know anything whatsoever about the external world? They all seem to be saying, well, our sense of what's possible, and therefore what would need to be eliminated by a conclusive reason, or what couldn't be in consideration for doubt to be intelligible, those sorts of things simply assume that doubts and evaluation always take place against the background of settled knowledge, which itself is in some way immune from questioning. But surely the philosophical question in the Cartesian tradition is how do we know about the external world at all? And this question is simply being ignored or bypassed. Now, now Wittgenstein says though, um, yes, that's true. And uh, the key remark though, um, the idealist, he says here, I won't go into why he says that, it's that Moore actually wasn't talking about skepticism in the proof, he was talking about idealism, but never mind. Um, rather, he will say he was not dealing with the practical doubt which is being dismissed, but there's a further doubt behind that one, that this is an illusion, must be shown in a different way. So in other words, it's no part of this view, and I think it's no part, um, this is where I think Wittgenstein in some way goes beyond, well, no, maybe he doesn't. It's no part of the Wittgenstein-Austin view that you could get rid of the skeptic simply by confronting the skeptic with these facts about the everyday procedure. So it must be accompanied by a diagnosis as to why there's something wrong in thinking that there's um, another kind of... Well, we've gone part of the way, of course, by questioning whether skeptical hypotheses which drive the skeptical doubt are really more than just fairy tales. We've gone some of the way. Uh, do I have time for this, Van, or do I need to pack it up? No, okay. Do you need? About five minutes. So uh, let's just um, look at a common, what's become a very common way of stating the skeptical argument, um, sometimes called the argument from ignorance. So 
so let O be some ordinary proposition, say I have hands, let SK be the skeptical hypothesis that I'm a handless brain in a vat, and then you get this very simple argument. I don't know that I'm not a brain in a vat, I'm not SK. If I don't know that not SK, I don't know that O, so I don't know that O. Now, a lot of people find one completely unassailable. I don't know that I'm not a brain in a vat. How could I, you know, if I were, things would appear just the same, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think the reason this way of stating the skeptical argument which has become so popular, I mean, you could find it in the medita first meditation, I guess, if you tried. Um, it, 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 it makes the diagnostic target whatever version of epistemic closure underwrites claim to. That if I don't know that not SK, I don't know that O. Oh. And ever since Dretzky introduced the issue of closure in, in 1970, it's been one of the main drivers, I think, of, of anti-skeptical theorizing. Initially, uh, by trying to deny it, as, 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 as Dretzky and Nozick did, and then later by trying to live with it, as a tribute to contextualists do. Um, of course, as you will have guessed, I do think I know that I'm not a brain in a vat. And in fact, I think that any epistemology which can't explain how has already failed. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it's a datum that I know I'm not a brain in a vat. Um, um, and I think closure is a complete red herring. I think that the issue just derailed discussion of skepticism for two generations. But, um, so, but for me, as for Wittgenstein and I believe also Austin, the crucial misstep is taken in one. Uh, uh, sorry, um, it's not one, I got my numbers wrong. The crucial step is taken in let O be some ordinary proposition. That's the crucial misstep. Um, that very way of formalizing the argument builds in the assumption that an everyday proposition can be identified by its, as it were, meaning or semantic content alone. But the proper objects of epistemic evaluation, according to Austin, and I believe Wittgenstein also, are not decontextualized propositions or co propositional contents. They are what Austin called statements in his essay on truth, namely claims made or commitments undertaken by particular speakers in particular circumstances. And here's some related remarks from Austin. One might grant that Moore was right if he's interpreted like this. A proposition saying that here is a physical object may have the same logical status as one saying that here is a red patch. Um, just as Austin said about sense data and material objects, um, the idea of everyday propositions about the external world is already brought in with a contrast between their objective truth and the mere perceptual appearance of their being so. One of these scholastic decisions, which is thought to be a completely transcontextual epistemic asymmetry. In the end, the one pr sort of truth provides all the evidence we could ever have for the other. But, you know, that's, it's quite obviously not the case. I mean, um, that, the, that the bottom line of the optometrist chart is just a grey blur is evidence that I need a stronger prescription. It's not evidence that the optometrist needs a new chart. Um, you know, depending on, sort of, so to say, what is up for evaluation, depends on the objective circumstances that we're in. Notice, I won't we can talk about this if you like. Um, it might very well be that if I were a brain in a vat, I wouldn't know that I was a brain in a vat, but it might be that if I am, then I do know that I'm not. Um, the idea is that what it's, what's come to be called the good case and the bad case are epistemically uh, symmetric. 
that's what the skeptic, the, the, the fan of skepticism thinks, but they might be epistemically asymmetric. Uh, and in fact, the imposition of that symmetry is one of Descartes' great moves in the first meditation. It's one that has no counterpart in the ancient skeptical materials that Descartes was drawing on. Cicero in the Academica puts dreaming in a box with drunkenness and madness. Of course the madman you know, will insist on his sanity, and the drunk will say, what, me, officer? No, no, I never touch a drop. But when he sobers up, or the man comes to his senses, he will say, oh, my goodness, what was I thinking then? I mean, in other words, case, uh, cases could... There could be, be deep circumstantial epistemic asymmetries. The case for skepticism in its most general form insists on occluding their possibility. Um, so, um, one may be wrong even about there being a hand here. Only in particular circumstances, it is impossible. Even in a calculation, one can be wrong. Only in certain circumstances one can't. Now of course skeptics and fans of skepticism have a response to this, namely, and it goes back to Descartes, that f philosophical reflection at the necessary level of generality requires setting aside practical interests. But this is just a deeply deceptive rhetorical maneuver. No one talked about practical interests here, we talked about the circumstantial character of intelligible doubt. The real effect of Cartesian occlusion of the practical, of practical interests is in fact to detach knowledge from circumstances. To detach the question of, a well, of whether a claim is knowledgeably made from the question of the circumstances in which it is entered. And of course, once you do that, it becomes possible to examine knowledge as such, as opposed to the knowledge one could have in such and such a situation. Um, now, I think that circumstances go beyond environmental conditions. Um, as Wittgenstein notes with thinking of Moore's defense, if Moore were to pronounce the opposite of those propositions, which he declares certain, we should not just share, not share his opinion, we should regard him as demented. And you know, especially imagine Moore saying, I've spent many years, many miles from the earth, which by the way, did not come into existence all that long ago, you know, to go through Moore's uh, things. <laughs> But notice Wittgenstein does not say this about the tribe who think they go to the moon, nor does he say it about the king who was brought up to believe the world began with him. <laughs> of course, it would a Cambridge Don who said these things, of the, a Cambridge Don of the interwar period, who, who made claims that he often visited the moon, or that the world began with him would certainly be demented. But not just anyone would be demented. One might have been brought up to believe those things. And I think this means that the circumstance, this is now what I was originally going to talk about, the circumstance dependent character of reasonable and rational belief means there are limits to argument if argument is anything like Morian proof, which is to say some more or less straightforward inference from agreed evidence. Um, Obviously, in the case of the moon visitors, we don't believe they go because of worries we have about how they fly there. Um, Wittgenstein's writing in the late 40s before the Apollo missions. I guess people had an idea that a system of booster rockets would be the way to do it, but nobody had actually figured out the technology of, uh, of how to make that, that work. So, um, and it was pretty clear these tribesmen hadn't, <laughs> as imagined. Okay, so um, that would be the limits to argument. But there's no rule, I think, that determines what circumstances logically exclude mistake. Um, so I think recognizing circumstances in which mistakes are impossible, which is a, a condition for basic knowledge, depends on a kind of know-how. It means therefore, I think, in the end, that the real limits are to epistemology, that knowledge can be, as it were, phenomenologically described, but is not 
beyond a rather limited point, an object of systematic theory. The cure for skepticism is skepticism about our subject, epistemology. Thank you.